Well, hello, my family and friends. Well, hello, my family and friends, brothers and sisters, and I think we are live. Um, this is new technology for me, being on Zoom and yet also being on Facebook Live. So I pray that this is coming through to you. I wanted to come on here and do a special broadcast. I just felt led to do this. I want to talk to you today about the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 and why they are still so important to this day, in case you're not familiar with the Bereans. I'm going to give you a moment to get your Bibles and get your note-taking devices, and because we're going to be looking at a couple of scriptures, I want to give you a background of who the Bereans are and why we should be studying scriptures the way they did back then. So we are in Acts chapter 17, and we find ourselves back in the year 54 to 55 AD, approximately 20 plus years after Jesus was crucified, rose from the dead, and returned to heaven. We find the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey, and he's in Greece, northern Greece. By the way, you like my library behind me? Years ago, I used to have a library that looked very similar to this. I had this many books, and I wish my library still looked like that today. But uh, let's get back to Paul. The year is AD 54, AD 55, second missionary journey. He has a man named Silas with him, and he's going to go into a town, a city called Thessalonica. That sounds familiar because two of the letters of the New Testament, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, were written about this church that was planted in Thessalonica. So to understand the Bereans, we need to go through Thessalonica. That's a tough word to say. Thessalonica first to find out how they wound up in Berea and what the difference was between the Thessalonican folks and the Berean folks. Uh, and so here we are beginning in the Acts 17. Let's just start right at the beginning of the chapter. Let's get the whole context here. I'm going to read a little bit and then we'll comment on it, okay? If you're with me, Acts chapter 17 it says, now when they, this is Paul and Silas and the group they were with, now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying to them, this is what he said to them, this Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. Paul had a pattern. As soon as he got into town, as soon as he got into a location, he went immediately right to the synagogue, which was the religious places of that time. He went to the synagogue and he immediately started reasoning them, the Bible says, for three straight Sabbaths. That means he was there for a minimum of three weeks. A Sabbath day was, of course, the Sabbath day, the Saturday, the seventh day of the week. So for three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them. He reasoned with them from what? The scriptures. But we have to be careful when we talk about the scriptures, because at the time that Paul was here, the, the New Testament did not exist. This was the Old Testament. He reasoned from the Old Testament. Now, why is that significant? Why is that important? Because the entire Bible is about Jesus Christ. The entire Bible is focused on Messiah coming and Jesus being the deliverer of his people for all who would believe in him. Now, you are not going to see the name Jesus Christ anywhere in the Old Testament because he doesn't show up until the New Testament in that name in human form. But in a pre-incarnate Christ, and we can look at this at other Bible studies, Jesus appears again and again and again and again throughout the Old Testament. So Paul, understanding this, reasoning with them, is telling them that the Christ that had just been crucified 20 years before was indeed the risen Christ, and Christ means Messiah. So he's reasoning in the synagogue of the Jews. Now remember Paul's background. He was a Pharisee. He was a Jewish man who was converted in Acts chapter 9 when he met Jesus on the Damascus Road. As a result of that, he stopped persecuting Christians, and he started 
witnessing in these Greek areas or these Gentile areas in Thessalonica happen to have a synagogue of the Jews there. But we're going to see that Paul and his friend Silas, is going, they're going to run into trouble and essentially they're going to be run out of town because very often when you preach the gospel and you tell people the truth and you tell the people who Jesus is, some people will accept it and we'll see that here. Other people get really angry and they don't want anything to do with you. They want you out of their sight. And we're also going to see that too. And that's what's going to lead these two men down south to Berea. So Paul preaches to them. Three straight Sabbaths, three straight weeks. Look what happens in verse four. It says, and some of them, Acts 4, chapter 17, and some of them were persuaded. They came to believe. And they joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks, that's the Gentiles, and a number of the leading women. Okay, when we preach, and as a preacher myself, there's no greater joy, there's no greater satisfaction than see someone come to truth. Not because we preach so great, not because we're something, but because we're sharing the living word of God with someone, and that word of God is penetrating their hearts and their souls, and they're coming to truth. Well, that's what we see here. In verse four, some of them were persuaded. Some of them came to truth and they would have joined Paul and Silas as they moved on and continued on their missionary journeys. But here's the other side of it. Verse five, there's other people that weren't so happy with what they were doing. Verse five says, but the Jews becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. This is where Paul and Silas were staying, at a house, but man's name was Jason. They're in the house. This mob shows up. They want them. Verse 6, when they did not find them there, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason, this man over here in this house that we've just dragged out, Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decree of Caesar, saying that there's another king, King Jesus. Well, yes, there's only one true king, King Jesus Christ. Well, here's these Jewish people that were upset at the fact that Paul, a Jewish man himself, was preaching that Jesus was the Christ. He was the Messiah. Jesus had the same problem 20 years before when he was preaching. Many of us that preach the gospel, we have the same problem. We come across those who are persuaded, and we come across those people that want to not believe what we say, or they don't want to accept the gospel, and they don't want to hear. And I've, I've mentioned this before on these broadcasts. I have folks that don't even talk to me anymore because I preach the gospel. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to not preach the gospel simply because somebody doesn't want to talk to me anymore or doesn't want to associate with me anymore. That's just unfortunate what happens. If you share the gospel with someone, you may have somebody that says, I understand what you're saying. Let's talk more about it. And you actually may see them come to Christ. You may have other people say, get out of my life. Get away from me. I don't want to hear that. I don't believe the Bible or whatever their reasoning might be. So Paul and Silas and company they're facing this dichotomy here. They have some that are believing, and they have some that are not believing. But now there's this angry mob that wants blood. It wants them. And they're beating up this man, Jason, and they're assaulting him because he dared to house them and be on their side, if I can use that way. It says here in verse 8 of Acts 17, they stirred up the crowd, and the city authorities heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. Okay, hands off. It's all right. Let it go. But here's what happens. As a result of this uproar, as a result of all of this violence that's happening here in Thessalonica, Paul and his friends have to get out of town. So here's what they do. It would have been a two-day journey back then by foot. They travel south through Greece, through northern Greece, and it would have been about 43 miles. Think about that, if those of you who walk. 
you figure it's 43 miles. It's about a two day journey by foot. So they're heading south from Thessalonica here and they're heading down to a place called Berea. They're going to get a totally different reception in this little town of Berea. And by the way, if you were to look that up on a map, Berea still exists today. It's a small town of about 50,000 people, I think, is Berea in, in Greece right now. They're still around. By the way, for those of you who are making notes, Berea means heavy, or it means weighty, W-E-I-G-H-T-Y, weighty, heavy, weighty matters, because the Bereans were wrestling with these heavy matters, and we'll see that in a minute. You can only read about the Bereans right here in these next three verses, verses 10, 11, and 12 of Acts 17. But in those three little verses, you're going to see, hopefully, in the next couple minutes, why it's so important that what they did, we are to emulate. Here's what happened. They come into town. In verse 10 of Acts 17 says, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night. Remember this violence that was happening with Jason up in Thessalonica. They had to get Paul and Silas out of town by night so they wouldn't be caught. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, look what they did. They went into the synagogue of the Jews. The pattern doesn't change. No matter where Paul went, you can see it again and again through his travels. His mission was to pre preach Christ to the people. Where are you going to find the people? The church had not been established yet. It's the early Acts. The apostles were meeting. But as Paul was going out into these outlying areas, there were no churches there. There were still synagogues there. And so Paul would have to go where the men were. He'd have to go where the people were. So immediately, there's no hesitation on Paul's part and Silas's part. They get into Berea, and it says they went, when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Okay, now Paul has a fresh new opportunity to preach to another group of people. Here's the difference. Even though some in Thessalonica got saved, they still ran into a lot of resistance. You're not going to see that here. Look at this. In verse 11, this is why the Bereans were so special. Not better than anyone else, just special in the way that they approached this. Now they, meaning the Bereans, were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. Noble-minded. They were more aware of things. They weren't better. They weren't richer. They weren't uh, better off economically. None of those things. Eliminate all of those things. They were more noble. They were more earnest in wanting to learn. Look what they did. It says they were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness. They received the word with great eagerness. They wanted to hear what Paul and Silas were preaching. They wanted to know the gospel. They wanted to hear about Christ. They received it with great eagerness. Their hearts were open. Their minds were open. Their eyes were open. And as Paul is preaching to them, reasoning with them from the scriptures, the Old Testament, they received it with all eagerness. When you hear a sermon, when you hear a Bible study like this, are you receiving it with eagerness? Are you picking and choosing what you're listening to and what you're not? Are you interested in things of God? Are you interested in the Bible? Not everyone is, of course not. But these folks heard Paul, but they went beyond that. First of all, you have to be eager. You have to be open. You have to be willing to hear the word of God. But they went further than that. Look what they did. They examined the scriptures daily, daily, not once in a while, not when you feel like it, not every other Sunday, not only when you're bored and you have nothing else to do. They searched the scriptures daily, every day. Why? For one reason, because they wanted to see whether these things were so. They wanted to make sure that the Apostle Paul, who in my opinion, was the second greatest preacher outside of Jesus. Jesus was, of course, by far the greatest preacher and Bible teacher who ever lived. Of course, he was eternal God himself. But Paul, I believe, was the second. Some would argue maybe Peter would be right up there, and he'd probably be number three for me. But 
Paul, who had the opportunity, I think he wrote like 17 books of the New Testament. I have to go back and count them all. Paul was no slouch as a preacher. And as good as he was, as thorough as he was, what did the Bereans do? They searched the scriptures, the Old Testament, to make sure that whatever Paul was saying to them, whatever they were hearing, was actually the truth. You and I need to do that. You and I owe no less to our own Bible study, no matter who, whether you're listening to me, whether you have a favorite preacher that you watch on television or listen to on the radio or a podcast, whether you are part of a local church and you love your pastor, you owe it to yourself. Now listen, you owe it to yourself to check out what you're hearing. This includes my own church that I co-pastor right now. You owe it to yourself to check out what you hear from your pastor or from your Bible teacher to make sure that what you're hearing is true. Now, I know, I know what you're thinking. The Bible's a big book, not easy to understand. I'm not a scholar. I didn't go to Bible college. I, I get it. I understand that. And I plan and, and hope to do a series of, of studies and instructional things to help you with some tools that you can use to help understand the Bible. This is kind of like an introduction, a beginning to give us some kind of foundation that somebody in scripture, somebody took things seriously. And that's what we're seeing here with these Bereans. Don't be intimidated by the Bible. Yes, it's a huge book. Yes, there's a lot of things we don't understand and we'll never understand, but that should never stop you from examining the scripture if you can. And we'll be giving you some tools to help you with that as well that will make things easier for you. Here's the Bereans. Imagine Paul preaching to them. Here's the Christ. Here's Jesus. Here's what he did. And here's from the scriptures that talked about Jesus, these prophecies and so on that came through. And yet they took every day to search and look at the scriptures. Now look what happened here in verse 12. As a result of them doing diligent study, look what happened in verse 12. Therefore, many of them believed, not just a couple, many of them believed, many, the majority, many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men, the Gentiles that were in there. Jews believed, Gentiles believed, because the kingdom of God, the true body of Christ, is made up of Jews and Gentiles all who have come together in Christ. We all have one thing in common. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Jesus was a Jewish man. Jesus was a rabbi. I come from the Greek side. I come from the Gentile side, my lineage, my family. I wasn't born with Jewish blood in me, to the best of my knowledge. I came from the Gentile side. But I'm just as much of a believer as a Jewish person who would come to Christ because we have one thing in common, and that is Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Do you see why it's so important of what the Bereans did and how just in these little verses, they're showing us, they're giving us a blueprint, a model of what we should be doing. Now, I don't need to, to, to get on the soapbox and start preaching about this, because one of the pet peeves that I've had over the years is all of the bad teaching and really bad preaching that's out there. Not everyone is called to preach or teach. Not everyone has the gift of preaching or teaching. I sometimes wonder, I don't know if I have it. I just do it to the best of my ability. But what, what troubles my spirit is when I hear and I see things that just are blatantly wrong, that with a little investigation, a little bit of Bible study, we'd be able to find and see that, wait a minute, this is, this is wrong. This is, not, this is not correct. It doesn't line up with the Bible. And I'm going to give you a couple of verses here that hopefully is going to help us uh, narrow down exactly what we should be looking for. These Bereans here, they're not out of the woods yet. They themselves are okay. I just want to read a couple more verses, and then I just encourage you to go back and look at the passage for yourself and spend time in it because it's really rich. Here's what happened. The Bereans are okay. Many of them are coming to truth. They're believing. They're searching the scriptures. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Look what happens in verse 13. But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out, uh-oh, you remember them from a few verses before? 
they're, they, they came down south. They came down to Berea. They heard that Paul and Silas are in this town doing the same thing, talking to the people in the synagogue, getting people converted. Look what happened. Verse 13, when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowd. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far out to the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. They got Paul out of town before something happened to him. And then, of course, his journey goes on. He then goes on to Athens, another part of Greece, and he continues on his second missionary journey. Now, Paul left Thessalonica in, on the cloak of darkness in the middle of the night. Now he's in Berea. He preaches. He sees a great harvest of souls, and he's got to get out of town again because people are against him, coming against him. We don't see anything else really about the Bereans. But what a lesson. What a lesson they gave us that we are to be diligent and study and receive the word, whether you're hearing a sermon, a Bible study, a lecture, if it has to do with the Bible and the word of God and Jesus Christ, we should be receiving that with eagerness. But we also just don't want to be naive and accept everything at face value because there's a lot of things that are being preached and taught that are simply wrong. And it's happening more and more as we get closer to Jesus' return. We know that that's going to happen. The Bible says there's going to be things that are going to be happening, false Christs, and there's false teachings. We're warned against that, and we need to be careful about that. We need to be diligent, studious Bereans. That is my plea to you today, to be a Berean. We're going to look at a couple of verses here that I happen to jot down, and I hope will help you. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me first of all. Let's do this. Let's go to 2 Timothy, okay? One of Paul's letters, by the way. Well, let's go to 2 Timothy, and I want to show you this verse here. 2 Timothy, of course, First and 2 Timothy was written for Paul's son in the faith, not his natural biological son, but Paul was, was grooming Timothy to become the pastor at Ephesus, and that's where the book of Ephesians comes from. Timothy was a younger man. And so first and second Timothy were really instruction manuals. They were father to son guidance. Here's what you do when you're in your congregation. Here's the things that you want to watch out for. Well, in first, second, second Timothy chapter two, verse 15, we hear this. This is what he told Timothy, but he's telling us to be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately or rightly dividing or handling the word of truth we have a responsibility it's not just for those like myself who are bible teachers and preachers yes i have a responsibility to preach and teach to you and with you and for you as accurately as i possibly can that is my heart's desire and over the years i've taught things that were wrong and as I grew in the faith and as I understood the Bible more, I had to go back and correct those. There may even be some old broadcasts out here from years ago where if you were to compare what I believe now versus what I believe seven or eight years ago when I started broadcasting, they'd probably be totally different because I've learned more. Well, I have to repent before God and, and realize that I'm learning more about Scripture and therefore God enlightens me, I can enlighten you. But this Scripture was... Paul is telling Timothy very clearly is saying, you be diligent, be on the ball, do this like a Berean, Dale, you be diligent, present yourself approved unto God. God is giving you a responsibility. God is giving you a task to preach and teach the word of God, and you better be diligent about it, and you better be accurate about it. And so it requires study. It says, present yourself approved to God as a workman, a workman. I'm a workman because my work is studying scripture, putting together sermons, putting together Bible studies, and presenting them to you. That is the work that I do. That is what God has called me to do. I am a workman. And so I look at this, and it's not just Paul writing to Timothy. It's Paul talking to Thomas, too. Ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit saying, Thomas, you be diligent. You present yourself approved to me, God, as a workman. I don't need to be ashamed, but I need to accurately or rightly divide or handle the word of truth. If I'm not handling the Bible correctly, 
if you're not understanding the Bible correctly, how is that helping the body of Christ? How am I blessing you in any way at all if I'm teaching you something that is blatantly wrong? I have to answer to God for that. James 3, verse 1 tells us that we should not, there shouldn't be many that want to be teachers because they receive the greater judgment. If I can find that real quick, that was one of the verses early on that I want to tell you scared me. Here it is, James 1 says, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such, as a teacher, as such, we will incur a stricter or greater judgment. Wow. Well, when I saw that, and God years ago said, essentially said to me, Thomas, you're going to seminary, and you're going to learn the word of God, and you're going to be a pastor and a preacher. I was scared because I knew that verse. I had read it many times and I thought, wow, there's plenty of things I can do in life and other ways I can serve the Lord. I don't want to teach. And here I am decades later still teaching the word of God. And that verse keeps me humble uh, and it keeps me working hard and putting in all those hours to study scripture to the best of my ability and to learn from others that, that I admire of those teachers and preachers that I believe are teaching accurately. I can learn from them and I can learn from scripture and I can learn ultimately through the Holy Spirit to put together even things like this to share with you. But there's a verse for those of us who are called to teach. Now, if I was just being careless and didn't care, and I could teach anything I wanted to do, then this verse doesn't apply to me. But we're talking about these Bereans here. I want to give you one more. I don't want the broadcast to get too long. I want to give you one more verse here over here in 2 Peter chapter 1. Because this is important when it comes to understanding scripture. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, Peter says this. But know this. First of all, know this first that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoken from God. What is, what is Peter saying here? Here's the example. This Bible cannot have a private interpretation. Here's the example. I say a scripture means this. You tell me the same scripture means that. Well, we have a dilemma, don't we? I can be right and you can be wrong. You could be right and I could be wrong. We both can be wrong. But one thing for sure, we both can't be right. We both can't come to different conclusions on the same scripture and both claim that we're right. That's called private interpretation. And how many times have you heard that? And I've heard it a gazillion times in my life. Well, that's what that scripture means to me. That's private interpretation. That's somebody saying, okay, you believe the verse this way. I believe it this way. And let's just part friends. That's not the way it works. And I know that's hard to take. I know that. That's not the way it works. That's not how it goes. There's one truth. It's called God's truth. And we need to be diligent like the Bereans were and see and study scripture daily to find out that what we're hearing is true. If I tell you the sky is orange and you know for a fact that the sky is blue, are you gonna blatantly just tell me, yes, I believe the sky is orange and I agree with you even though I know it's wrong or I'm gonna find out and investigate why you say that sky is orange and come to the truth that it's really blue. Well, this is what Peter's talking about. He's saying no prophecy was ever made by any human will. I can't tell you that this means A, and you say it means B, we have to come to some agreement. And that comes through the Holy Spirit. It says, men were moved by the Holy Spirit, spoken from God. When we're doing Bible study, we want to be as accurate, as diligent, as steadfast and focused as we can be. There are times we come across things in the Bible. I still do. My goodness, I still do. Decades decades after I started reading the Bible. I don't know all of it. My guess is I only know a very small percentage of it. When I come across something I don't understand, I have to study it. I don't preach or teach anything that I can't prove scripturally. 
because that would be irresponsible of me. I won't share anything on any of these broadcasts ever, whether you're joining me on Wednesday night study or Sunday service or watch any of the Bible studies I've done in the past. I will not put anything out there that I can't prove biblically, but it comes from many hours of study and being a Berean. So that's all I really wanted to share with you on this broadcast, how to be a Berean. Why is it so important? Why is it important that we spend time studying the Word of God? Or if you hear this great sermon from your favorite preacher, don't just accept it at face value. It doesn't mean you have to dismiss everything he or she says. But we want to be diligent to look into Scripture and make sure that what we're hearing is true. If you hear something that's so outrageous and so outlandish, chances are it is. So we have to be able to study for that. So Going forward, I hope to be able to make a couple of videos with some tools that will help you to be uh, uh, an accurate Bible student. Again, don't be intimidated. It's a huge book. There's 66 books in the Bible, and you could study the Bible for a thousand years and still not get all of it. So please do not think, well, I don't, I don't know where to start. A good place to start is go right back to Acts 17 and watch what happens as the word of God is presented. Some believe, some don't believe. The purpose of this video was to tell you the Bereans were always very special to me and have been for many years because they taught us a pattern. Accept what you're hearing with eagerness, but don't be foolish about it. Go and then check out the scriptures themselves. You check out every scripture reference that a pastor gives you. If he's preach, he or her preaching through a particular passage, take notes. If you see a certain word that you don't understand, circle it, under, underline it and then study that word later on. There are tools that we can help. We can help you with that, and I will make sure that I do that. But for right now, I thank you for tuning in. If you're watching this live, or you catch this at a later time, I'm gonna repost this, not only here on Facebook, but I'm gonna put it onto my YouTube channel. Please feel free to share it if this has been any blessing to you whatsoever. And I wanna thank you for being with me today, and may God richly bless you in your Bible study. Thanks for being here. <music>